welcome Professor Sarah Johnson up next. Uh, Sarah, as many of you will know, um, is part of the iSphere team that is really leading, world leading research in uh, homelessness. And um, Sarah is particularly working around people with complex needs and homelessness. She's uh, really part of uh, policy drivers around housing first. Um, and they're doing some really exciting work at Harriet Watt. So we're really delighted to have Sarah here today. And Sarah's going to uh, explore some of the issues around the relationship between homelessness and adverse childhood experiences. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, Fiona. The subject of adverse childhood experience is featuring more and more in conversations about homelessness policy and practice, and to my mind this is an incredibly positive development. The escalation in interest um, in ACE within the homelessness sector is largely the result of and has grown in concert with improved understandings about the backgrounds of and challenges faced by one particular subset of the homeless population. This being people experiencing the most extreme forms of exclusion and disadvantage, including the most visible forms of homelessness, such as rough sleeping, but also some combination of other issues, such as drug and or alcohol addiction, severe mental health problems, um, involvement with the criminal justice system, and or involvement in activities such as begging, street drinking, or street-based sex work. They comprise a relatively small proportion of the overall homeless population, but are at disproportionate risk of all sorts of awful things, including, amongst others, extreme ill health, being victim to physical assault and premature death. In most local authorities across the UK, there are a group of individuals who leave council staff and other service providers scratching their heads because they just don't know what to do with them. They are the individuals who cycle on, or on and off the street, in and out of hostels, prison, psychiatric wards, rehabilitation centres and so on. They are offered all sorts of support and sometimes do okay for a while, but then things tend to go a bit pear-shaped for them. And nobody seems to has been able to find a solution for them that breaks that cycle of repeat homelessness once and for all. Frontline practitioners working within the sector sometimes um, describe such individuals as being incredibly difficult to work with sometimes a bit reluctant to engage with support, sometimes downright rude, and on occasion even a bit abusive. They're often referred to as hard to reach, difficult to engage, service resistant, and other such sometimes rather less diplomatic terms. All the key stakeholders in local homelessness services, addiction teams, community policing teams, and so on, know them by name. Now perhaps surprisingly, Whilst there's been a swathe of research done on the causes and particularly the immediate triggers to homelessness, there's been very little research done to date which looks as far back as childhood. Um, but there has, I'm pleased to say, been a push to rectify this fairly recently. And it probably won't be a surprise to those of you here present that this nascent research suggests that most homeless people with complex needs share one thing in common, that being adversity during childhood. And those experiences have affected them in profound ways, which have implications not just for their susceptibility to homelessness um, and other disadvantages, but also the way they relate or not to support. So against that backdrop, I want to reflect on three questions this morning. Firstly, how prevalent is ACE amongst the adult homeless population? And what does this still fairly limited research tell us about how many homeless people are affected and what sort of adversities they've experienced? Secondly, what are the implications of adversity in childhood for, firstly, risks to homelessness and adulthood? And secondly, um, the extent to which and ways in which people affected engage with support? And thirdly, what does existing evidence tell us about the implications for service providers? Now, I'll be drawing very heavily on the work of one of my PhD students, Nicoletta Theodoro, um, whom I'm co-supervising with Dr Beth Watts from here at Watt and Dr Adam Burley from NHS Lothian, who's sitting here. Um, now, Nicoletta extends her sincere apologies. She's unable to be with us today, and I've um, assured her I'll do my very best to do justice to her research. Her study focuses on the influence of trauma on attachment and the impact this has on the way multiply excluded homeless people engage or not with support services. She's completed her field research and is currently in the process of analysing the swathes of data she's collected. 
I'll be giving you a, a tiny glimpse into some of her preliminary findings with her permission. And I'm sure those of you with an interest in homelessness will await the publication of her findings as eagerly as myself. I'll also make some reference to some of the insights recently published by Adam Burley. Now, I've not warned Adam this. I'm hoping he's okay with this. If you haven't had the privilege of meeting Adam, he's a, um, a consultant clinical psychologist uh, who works in a specialist homelessness practice here in Edinburgh. I'll also be drawing on a number of studies I've been directly involved with, most of which involve my colleagues I'm in iSphere at Harriet Watt. Before I do, I want to make one caveat. Past experience tells me that it can be a bit risky when talking about trauma in relation to homelessness. Because when you do, some stakeholders accuse you of pathologising homeless people and overemphasising individual factors in debates about causation. I'm really hoping I'll be at less risk of such accusations in the present company. Um, I hope you'll be happy for me to leave such debates aside today. Please just take as given that I'm very aware of the structural drivers underpinning homelessness and would never want to give um, undue weight to them. In fact, I've been harping on about the need to kind of reintegrate poverty into discussions about homelessness for so long that I'm beginning to bore myself. But these particular caveats aside, let's look at what the evidence does tell us. <coughs> The best data we currently have on the nature and prevalence of ACE experienced by homeless people came from what was known as the Multiple Exclusion Homelessness Study conducted at Heria Watt a few years ago. That involved in-depth surveys with 452 users of low threshold services in several cities across Great Britain. And by low threshold services, I mean things which do not require referral and will support people without them first kind of signing up to a care plan, if you like. Think soup runs, soup kitchens, street outreach services, night shelters, drop-in advice services, needle exchange schemes and so on. Now all participants had multiple or complex needs in the sense that they were not only homeless but also had experience of one or more of the following things. Substance misuse issues, in, um, experience of institutional care and or involvement in street culture activities such as begging, street drinking, survivalist crime or sex work wherein crime or sex work is conducted in order to meet one's essential living needs or fund an addiction. That study is particularly, um, or arguably, best known for highlighting the fact that for most people with complex needs, homelessness, particularly in its most visible forms, is typically a relatively late manifestation of disadvantage, which is preceded by all sorts of other issues, such as the onset or escalation of substance misuse issues, mental health problems, involvement in antisocial behaviour or criminality. The study did trace respondents' experiences right back to childhood and this is what we found. Now we didn't employ any kind of standard ACE questionnaire and we also considered educational disruption as well as things as, such as abuse and neglect. But we did ask about a number of relevant things that will be of interest. The vast majority, or 78% of the people we spoke to, had experienced at least one of the things listed. Sexual and physical abuse were reported by 23% and 22% respectively. 15% reported not having enough to eat at home. 27% had witnessed violence between their parents or carers. And 24% reported that one or more parents or carers had a drug or alcohol problem. Now that study served as inspiration for Nicoletta's work on trauma and attachment. Nicoletta has recently conducted in-depth interviews with 30 people who have experienced this form of homelessness, the most multiple excluded, multiply excluded forms in Scotland. She administered um, a 10-point ACE questionnaire alongside another interview-based tool, and here is what she found. Now, you'll have to forgive the rather rudimentary fashion in which this is displayed. I'm slightly ashamed after having seen the previous speaker's most magnificent slides. I'm no statistician. Um, so all it does is it shows the, the ACE kind of count cumulatively along the x-axis and simple frequencies on the y-axis. And the general weighting of distribution towards the high end of the scale is, is obvious even to someone such as myself. And the things I would particularly want to draw your attention to is that of the 30 people interviewed, 27 had experienced three or more, two-thirds had experienced four or more. And of course, one can't help but note that two individuals ticked every one of the 10 boxes in the questionnaire. Now, I'm assuming that most of you, if not all of you present, are very familiar with the, the kind of adversities those sort types of questionnaires list. But for the benefit um, of anyone who may not, this means that for those individuals, during childhood, they had been emotionally abused, physically abused, sexually abused, physically and emotionally neglected, experienced parental divorce or separation, witnessed domestic violence, lived with someone who was a problem drinker or drug user, 
lived with someone who suffered from mental health problems and had a household member go to prison. The stories associated with their childhood, which were shared during the interviews, can only be described as harrowing. And their accounts of life during adulthood are also complex and highly distressing. Now we know, you all know as well as I, a vast body of research confirms that these sorts of experiences can have pervasive effects in adulthood. And personally, I've always been struck by the proportion of homeless people I've interviewed who've begun to answer a question I've posed about the causes of their current situation with a phrase along the lines of, well, when I was seven or four or six. To them, the root cause in their homeless, homelessness lay not in their most recent eviction or relationship breakdown, but in traumatic experiences occurring much earlier in life. We also know that um, ACEs create barriers to recovery. And here's where I uh, begin to plagiarise your work, Adam. I hope you're OK with this. Most, if not all of you, are probably very familiar with the evidence that suggests that ACE influences an individual's ability to regulate emotions, cope with challenge, and sustain relationships. Significantly, traumatic experience can often underpin certain individuals' tendencies to be highly ambivalent toward or dismissive of care. And here comes an Adam. He explains that childhood adversity has a significant impact um, on the way that people relate to others and others relate to them. Adam talks about how all health and social care is fundamentally relational, involving one group of people, service users, patients, and so on, coming into contact with another group, support workers, doctors, and so on, in a relational dynamic that centres around the need for and provision of care. Often, when service users communicate the histories by behaving in distressing ways, or at best failing to engage in the way they're supposed to, by turning up for appointments, for example, they are excluded or discharged. And so the cycle of exclusion and rejection continues and makes already vulnerable people even more reluctant to seek and make use of support. Adam explains that service providers are often guilty of behaving in what he calls an institutionally autistic way, a phrase I think is really quite telling, um, because they assume that everyone can make use of support in a straightforward and anxiety-free way. When in actual fact, while some of the kinds of people I've been talking about desperately need and often want care, they may at the same time be quite phobic of it. Now, mainstream homelessness services quite understandably struggle to cope with this ambivalence and dismissal. The increase in appetite within the homelessness sector for psychologically informed um, and trauma-informed services recognises these issues and promotes ways of working that aim to avoid re-enacting the forms of exclusion that may have left a service user in need of support in the first place. And here is where I want to share some of the recent learning regarding what does and doesn't work for homeless people with complex needs. In the UK, as in most Western countries, the mainstream approach to housing street homeless people can be described as a staircase or treatment first approach, which, crudely speaking, aims to fix the homeless person and then house them. This typically involves placing them in transitional housing, often a hostel, perhaps followed by some other form of supported accommodation, and then, when they are assessed as housing ready, they allocated independent housing. Now, some people cope relatively well with this system and successfully make their way to the top of the staircase. But this tends not to be the case for people with complex support needs, most of whom, as I've noted, have experience of adversity in childhood. The process of recovery from mental illness and substance misuse, misuse is not beautifully linear like this. And people who suffer from these issues often struggle to cope with the rules and the regulations and the expectations at each stage. They all too often fail at one or more stages and abandon or get evicted. And so find themselves homeless once more and the cycle continues. Frustrated by the ineffectiveness of this approach, a psychiatrist who worked with street homeless people in New York City, Dr. Sam Simberis, developed an alternative approach, which he called housing first. Housing First does things very differently and, in effect, circumnavigates transitional accommodation. It places homeless people directly into independent settled accommodation without expecting them to successfully navigate their way through transitional accommodation and, importantly, provides ongoing, flexible <coughs> and holistic support. So to go back to that crude analogy, Housing First does not fix people and then house them, but rather houses them so that they are in a much better position to address other issues in their lives. It's been highly effective. 
and it's now being replicated across most Western countries, given compelling evidence that it works for the vast majority of homeless people with complex needs. On average, around 80% of Housing First residents are still housed at least two years after being accommodated, which is pretty remarkable, given the complexity of their housing histories. All other sorts of positive outcomes are also recorded around things like health and substance misuse, um, and they're positive on balance, but not as impressive as the housing outcome statistic. But of course one can't help but ask, what is it about Housing First that accommodates and apparently helps to overcome this dismissal of or ambivalence of care um, that I was referring to earlier? Well, I think four things. I've done a lot of empirical research on Housing First and I've been reviewing um, evidence about, regarding its effectiveness for, for nearly a decade now. And after pondering on all of that in my usual unashamedly geekish fashion, I've concluded that these are four critical ingredients that seem to make it more effective than mainstream approaches. I'll talk through each in turn, but by way of overview, here's the overall list. Firstly, longevity, the fact that housing and support is not time limited. Secondly, flexibility, in terms of the intensity and nature of support provided. And thirdly, the stickability of support. Now, I normally try and avoid using words that aren't words, but I've yet to find one that does the job as well <laughs> as that, so please bear with me. If anyone can think of an alternative, I would uh, welcome hearing of that. And finally, normality. Housing First uses normal housing and support, and it's not delivered in homeless settings. Now, you'll note that the slides that follow and contain a few quotes from Housing First residents, um, and these actually came from an evaluation of the first Housing First pilot in the UK, just down the road in Glasgow, which was developed by Turning Point Scotland, um, and I had the privilege of leading the evaluation of a few years back. Right, so longevity. I'd like to highlight the immense value afforded by two things. Firstly, long-term security of tenure. Now, the founder of Housing First, Sam Samberis, has always argued that providing someone with secure housing without first insisting that they are housing ready gives them a stable platform from which they are in a much better position to address other issues in their lives. The knowledge that the housing is theirs for as long as they need it, or as they want it, obliterates anxieties about what happens next. Um, and that sort of frees up headspace to devote to other things. Multiple conversations I've had over the years confirm that we should never underestimate the significance of this in fostering someone's recovery. The same holds true for the second thing noted here, the fact that support is not time limited. Now, most mainstream tenancy support programs, which the majority of Housing First users have had some experience of at some point or other, have a clear termination date, and that support ends after three months or six months or whatever. I have no idea where these cutoffs come from. I suspect they've been plucked out of the air by commissioners over the years and have just become normalised as the way things are done. I mean, I could be wrong on that, but they certainly don't seem to be founded on any robust evidence regarding the length of time that actual people really need support. Indeed, the high rate of repeat homelessness suggests that the cutoffs are pretty wide of the mark for this particular client group at least. And the Housing First users I've spoken to over the years have consistently highlighted the immense value of knowing that the support will always be there, even if it's not needed right now. Secondly, flexibility. Housing First offers much more flexible support than mainstream transitional housing programs. It's more flexible in that its intensity can fluctuate according to their needs, and allowing for peaks and troughs and levels provided, and dormant periods where none is required without signing people off. It's also much more flexible in terms of the type of support, so it's not just about tightly defined housing support, which most tenancy support programs are, but it supports people in all areas of their lives, including health, substance misuse, meaningful activity, employability, relationships, and so on and so forth. Crucially, this flexibility in personalisation and delivery gives service providers a greater chance of remaining in a positive relationship with users. Um, as users are not being passed from pillar to post or have past experiences of being let down by services repeated because what they need is outside of a service provider's remit or exceeds the number of support hours that are costed for. Thirdly, the word that's not really a word, stickability. Housing First is quite unique in the homelessness world and that the support stays with individuals for as long as they need it, even if they relapse, get incarcerated or encounter some other crisis that would normally render them ineligible for support um, and often cause them to lose their accommodation. The housing and support are detached in that sense. 
Many Housing First users have been excluded from and in their review rejected by support services for years and years. Some have rendered themselves ineligible for support time and time again by failing to show up for appointments or not engaging in the way or to the extent that they are supposed to. For lots, these patterns confirm their often long-held view that they are not worthy of support and or that service providers, like so many other people in their lives, cannot be relied on. And so it comes as something of a shock to Housing First users when staff simply will not give up on them, but they keep persistently, respectfully, and often quite assertively offering support. Some of the service users I've spoken to over the years admit that they've really <coughs> tested the staff on this, and they couldn't quite believe it when not only did they not get signed off the program, but the staff did not even seem to hold the slightest grudge. So what does this do? It facilitates trust and increases receptivity to support. This can be a lengthy process, but it can and does happen. Some users have also highlighted the fact that the stickability of support enables them to be truly honest with their support workers. Many have, by their own admission, been lying for years about their addiction, their involvement in antisocial behaviour as either perpetrator or a victim, and so on, because of fears that if they tell the truth about these things, things like relapses, they'll be kicked out of a service. So for some, Housing First offers them what they consider to be the first opportunity to be genuinely honest with support workers about their levels and frequency of drug use, their relationship difficulties, whatever. And this really, really helps them on their journey toward recovery. The final key ingredient, normality. Housing First uses ordinary scatter site housing that is not differentiated in any way from other homes in that neighbourhood. Support is delivered not in specialist homeless settings, but in someone's own home and community. Housing First also offers what some to be, perceive to be um, an escape from the destructive cultures in congregate forms of accommodation such as hostels, wherein issues of bullying and exploitation and exacerbation of substance misuse problems are very commonly reported. Housing First's normality also mitigates stigma and facilitates integration into mainstream society if and when residents feel ready to do so at the pace they wish to do so and to the extent they wish to. So what can we take from the emerging evidence on the prevalence and nature of ACE amongst the most severely excluded homeless populations and from the rollout of Housing First with that particular clientele? Well, lots of things, I think. But there are two in particular that I'd want to highlight. Firstly, and it's so obvious that I feel a bit daft saying it, but there's a clear and compelling need for far more effective prevention initiatives, which intervene much earlier in the lives of people who are at risk of developing severe and multiple forms of disadvantage later in life. And secondly, there is value in service providers recognising the impact of adversity on individuals' often ambivalent and or dismissive relationships with care, and doing all in their power to avoid excluding or neglecting them for behaving in ways that are entirely understandable and to an extent predictable. And therein endeth my musings. Thank you very much.